Hi, my name is Kathy. I'm one of the educators with the Saskatoon Zoo Society. Welcome to the Saskatoon Forestry Farm Park and Zoo and our Species at Risk Tour. We're going to take a look at today at, at some animals that live here from Saskatchewan. And but whether an animal lives here in Saskatchewan or another place in the world, many of our species are under pressure from habitat loss and fragmentation. So we're going to go check them out and see how their species are doing in the wild. Our first animal we're going to go visit can communicate really, really well with the rest of its pack. So let's go check them out. This is Buddy, the grey wolf here at the Saskatoon Zoo. Do we have wolves living in the wild in Saskatchewan? If you said yes, you'd be right. But they don't roam the whole province like they once did. In the north, we have a healthy population of wolves because they have a lot of habitat with fewer people in it. In the southern part of the province, when Saskatchewan was settled, we eradicated a lot of the carnivores from the land. And when we did that, we used poisoning campaigns to do it. Unfortunately, that not only affected the wolf in southern Saskatchewan, but also a lot of the other carnivores that live there as well. Our next animal that we're going to go and see is a much more elusive than the wolf and solitary. Cougars are our largest cat species here in Saskatchewan. Malcolm is a cougar that was orphaned in the Cypress Hills area in 2009. In our province, that's where you would traditionally find them, the Cypress Hills area, the Pasqua Hills areas, or perhaps near Moose Mountain. But if they left those areas, traditionally they would have come into conflict with humans and would have been shot and killed. In 1971, cougars were protected here in Saskatchewan. However, landowners can still hunt a cougar if it's posing a threat to their livestock, people, or to property. Right now, in Saskatchewan, we probably have about 350 cougars that call Saskatchewan home. Not a huge amount, but all that their current habitat can support. Cougars and other large carnivores are really an indication of a really healthy ecosystem. However, the challenge for humans is how do we learn to coexist with these large carnivores in our, in our environment. And speaking of large, wolves and cougars can take down the largest prey animal in Saskatchewan. That's the bison. Imagine coming to the Great Plains of North America 150 years ago. The grasslands was teeming with animals, and a lot of those were hoofed animals. Things such as moose and mule deer, pronghorn, and of course the largest prey animal in Saskatchewan, the bison. Bison were incredibly important and an integral part of the ecosystem. There was tens of thousands of bison roaming the grasslands. And these bison provided everything for the carnivores that lived here. Not only the carnivores, but for the indigenous people that lived here. They provided everything they needed to survive. Everything from tools and food, implements, shelter, clothing. All of the things that they needed to survive was provided for them by the bison. Unfortunately, the bison with settlement were hunted to the brink of extinction. And by 1895, almost every last bison in Saskatchewan was gone. Only through the efforts of conservationists were they able to be saved. And only because they saved habitat. So through the saving of habitat and captive breeding programs, the bison was saved from the brink of extinction. But numbering the same as the bison here on the Great Plains of North America were also our next unique animal, and that is the pronghorn. You may have heard of this animal being referred to as an antelope, but they're not related to antelope at all. This is a unique species of an animal that only exists here in North America. They are called the pronghorn because they are the only animal with a prong on its horn. And they have existed in this part of the world since the last ice age, when there was probably a whole bunch of species with prongs on their horns. But the only one that survived is the pronghorn. And the pronghorn is our fastest land animal here in North America. In fact, they can probably maintain 40 to 60 kilometers an hour for two hours. So that's an incredible amount of speed, which means if they got a head start, they could probably even outrun the fastest land animal in the world, the cheetah. The cheetah can only maintain those fast speeds for up to three minutes. That means these guys are super fast. And around the time of the last ice age, we had lots of different animals here. Things like mammoths and smilodons, the big saber-toothed cats. Perhaps that's why they developed such a huge heart and lungs, so they could outrun those great predators. Here in Saskatchewan, 
the number of pronghorn that when Saskatchewan was settled easily equaled the number of bison that we had on the grasslands. Like the bison, the pronghorn were also hunted to the brink of extinction and were only saved by the efforts of conservationists and land management strategies to be able to save them. And today, they are not a species at risk. Even though we don't have the vast numbers that were once here, we still have a healthy population of pronghorn in North America. Unfortunately, our next species didn't fare quite as well, and it is a species at risk. Reindeer or caribou. This animal has been called both. In Europe, they're commonly called a reindeer. But here in Canada, we use the indigenous term of caribou, which means the one that paws the earth. And that's because carib caribou like to eat lichen. They have great big feet that they use to paw the, paw the earth and to dig up the lichens. Lichens also like to grow on old growth forests. So the woodland caribou needs to have old growth forest in, either, in order to survive and thrive. Unfortunately, with deforestation, a lot of their habitat is disappearing. That means if you replant those trees, you also need to make sure that you have some of those old growth trees left as well. So there is a food supply for the caribou. Caribou can also be impacted on their long migration routes to their calving grounds. Along this route, if there's lots of disturbance of their natural habitat, and for humans that often means resource uh, exploration through oil and gas exploration, um, when they're exploring those things, it can disrupt the migration of the caribou to their calving grounds and making them more vulnerable to predation and that sort of thing. As well as in the, if they're in the woodlands, anytime we're building roads into woodlands to get at resources, we're also giving easier, easier access for humans and for predators to get at the caribou as well. Like the caribou, other species of animals are also being impacted by human activity. The next one we're going to see is a raptor. Can you guess what that is? Our great horned owl here is a raptor. Those encompass all of the meat-eating birds. Those are things like the owls, the hawks, eagles, falcons. They are all raptors. And great horned owls are actually one of the most widely distributed raptors on the planet. So they are not a species at risk. But some of the other ones are, and yet they inhabit the same habitat. So habitat isn't just space, it's all the interactions that happen in that space. And in that space, these animals are sharing the same food source. They are hunting for small mammals. But if you're an owl, they are not all owls, but most owls are nocturnal. So you're right, that means they hunt at night. These guys are nighttime hunters. But then you look at some of the other animals, like the hawks, the ferruginous hawk especially, but all of the other hawks, they are daytime or diurnal hunters, not nocturnal, which means they're hunting during the day. So even though they're eating the same food, they are being able to share it by hunting at different times. That means that they can share without being in conflict with each other. However, human activity has affected their habitat. If you remember, when Saskatchewan was being settled, huge poisoning campaigns were taking place to get rid of a lot of the large carnivores on the grasslands, to be able to open up the grasslands for settlement and agriculture. That means though, that if you're a sight hunter, like a hawk, you're gonna be using your eyes to hunt with. And that means if somebody's put poisoned meat out, well, it's just a free meal and you're probably gonna swoop down and eat it. So a lot more sight hunters in the raptor family became at risk. The nocturnal ones like the owls, they actually spend most of their time using their hearing in order to hunt their prey. They also have exceptional sight at dusk and dawn, but it's their hearing that really makes them really good nocturnal hunters. And so they would be listening for a mouse in the grass. And then when they heard that mouse in the grass, they would go for it. And by catching that mouse, they were probably catching prey that wasn't sick or injured, and they could um, have a healthy meal that would keep their species alive. So even a little thing, like about the time of day that an animal hunts, combined with our human behavior, can impact the survival of a species. The next animal on our tour is one of the largest raptors in North America. 
Dawson and Juno are our bald eagles here at the zoo. Dawson is our male and Juno is the female. If you're having trouble figuring out which one is which, take a look at their size. With birds of prey, the, typically the females are larger than the males. Both Dawson and Juno were injured in the wild. As a result, they both have partial wing amputations. Although we don't know exactly how they were injured, typically it's as a result of uh, collisions with power lines or cars. Here in Canada and Alaska, bald eagles are not considered threatened. We actually have a fairly healthy population, mostly because their habitat doesn't have a lot of human encroachment, and of course, it's full of their favorite prey source. We have a lot of fish, and they are excellent, excellent hunters at catching fish. However, the story is different in the rest of the United States. About the time, or just after the time of the last World War, there was an introduction of a pesticide called DDT into the environment. It was used to control things like mosquitoes and pests. Unfortunately, it also affected a lot of birds of prey as well as other birds. It actually interrupted their ability to form really, really strong eggshells, which means they had a difficulty in reproducing. By 1972, they were actually, DDT was actually banned in the environment. And by 2007, bald eagles populations had stabilized in the U.S. to the point where they could be taken off the species at risk list, which means our behavior can affect other species, both positively and negatively. So our behavior helped them to rebound in the wild. Our next animal is also a carnivore. However, it's a lot more like you and I than you would think. Brown bears are also known as grizzly bears here in North America. Here at the zoo, we have two bears. We have Coda and Mistea. They're both males, and they, but they are unrelated. They were both orphaned in different parts of Alberta in 2005. And we often think of Alberta and uh, British Columbia as being home to a lot of grizzly bears. But what you might not know is that here in Saskatchewan, before settlement, grizzly bears would have been found right across the grasslands. And they would have been native to Saskatchewan. When Saskatchewan was settled, a lot of the large carnivores were eradicated, again through the poisoning campaigns. The last grizzly bear seen in Saskatchewan was in 1939. So we no longer have grizzly bears as part of Saskatchewan. However, they are lumped in with the populations in both Alberta and BC, and as a total, they are considered of special concern. Here in Saskatchewan, we consider them extirpated from the grasslands of Saskatchewan. Unlike black bears, brown bears or grizzlies don't do well living close to humans. Therefore, they need huge uninterrupted uh, territories. And human activity as building roads and highways, that sort of thing can fragment their territories and make it harder for them to find mates. One of the reasons that grizzly bears are a spe species of special concern here in Western Canada. The next animal on our tour is a very elusive animal and lives in the boreal forest. Hi, we're here at the Canada Lynx enclosure. We have two Canada Lynx here at the zoo. We have Thelma and Louise. Those are two female lynx that are related. And the Canada Lynx is our medium-sized cat in Saskatchewan. Its natural habitat is the boreal forest regions of Saskatchewan. The favorite prey of the Canada Lynx is the snowshoe hare, a very, very agile animal. And that means the lynx has to be able to chase a snowshoe hare across its habitat, even in deep snow which means Canada lynx have really, really large paws. Those large paws are really furred at the bottom and work as built-in snowshoes so that they can chase the uh, snowshoe hare. Even with all those skills, the snowshoe hare, about nine times out of 10, is gonna get away. Currently, the Canada lynx is not a threatened species here in Saskatchewan, but their populations are closely related to their prey, the snowshoe hare. And snowshoe hare, their populations cycle. So they will, they will go up and then crash about every eight to 10 years. So if we happen to be in a low cycle of snowshoe hare, there will be less lynx uh, being born that year and their populations will come down as well. If human behavior is disruptive to the habitat of the Canada lynx, that means, especially when the population of snowshoe hare is low, we could eventually affect the population of Canada lynx as well. 
So a very, very agile animal. The next animal on our tour is also very agile. This animal on our tour is the swift fox. Unfortunately, swift foxes are a species at risk here in Saskatchewan. They are one of the three foxes that make Saskatchewan home. We have red foxes, the swift fox, which is a grasslands fox, and if you get up to, up to the very northern part of the province, you might get lucky and see an arctic fox. The swift fox makes the grasslands home. Unfortunately, they were extirpated in Saskatchewan in the 1920s. That means they were gone, totally gone from Saskatchewan. But in other parts of the world, they existed in parts of the northern U.S. and so they could be brought into captive breeding programs and eventually released back to the wild. Here in Saskatchewan, those programs were successful and we currently have around 600 swift foxes that make Saskatchewan home. However, their habitat is under a lot of pressure from a lot of resource development. They're basically based out of Grasslands National Park and moving outwards from there. Their habitat is more than just space. It's all the interactions that take place in that habitat. So it's a very complicated ecosystem, which means that if there's other animals around, they will affect the survival of the swift fox. The swift fox actually has a really cool relationship with its bigger cousin, the gray wolf. And if there's gray wolves around, well, there's gonna be some more swift foxes around because gray wolves don't usually hunt swift foxes. A tiny fox like the swift fox isn't enough to feed a whole pack. So for the most part, they're going to leave them alone. But you know who the swift fox doesn't get along with? They don't get along with the coyote because coyotes will actually hunt swift foxes. But the coyotes don't like the gray wolf. So if there's lots of gray wolves in the, in the, in the habitat, then, this, then the coyotes will take off and it's a better for the swift foxes. So those complicated interactions can also affect their survival in the wild. Along with the swift fox, the next animal also makes the grasslands home. They live in communities called towns. Millions of prairie dogs once called the Great Plains of North America home. Being a rodent, their numbers can increase very, very quickly. However, they had competition historically. As a grass eater, there was lots and lots of bison and pronghorn around which would compete for grass for the prairie dog, limiting their numbers. Also, prairie dogs were lunch for a lot of the carnivores that lived on the Great Plains. With settlement though, we got rid of a lot of the huge uh, hoofed animals out on the grasslands like the bison and the pronghorn, as well as a lot of the carnivores like the wolves, creating a really, really perfect system for the populations of prairie dogs to explode. With very little animals to compete for grass and nothing eating them, their populations exploded from the millions to the billions. And you can't do agriculture with that many prairie dogs running around. So there were huge poisoning campaigns to eliminate the prairie dog from the grasslands. Today, you can only find prairie dogs in southern Saskatchewan in Grasslands National Park. They're a very, very social animal that live in communities called towns. And within those towns, they have neighborhoods of close family members. Black-tailed prairie dogs are considered a keystone species in their ecosystem. If you remove them, a lot of other species will be affected as well. That's considered the keystone species. So other animals, in fact, our most endangered mammal in Saskatchewan is affected by the loss of the prairie dog. The black-footed ferret almost eats exclusively prairie dogs. You get rid of prairie dogs, you're gonna get rid of the ferrets. And that's why, they're, that's why they're in a threatened species. In fact, at one point, they were pushed to the brink of extinction and are trying to be reintroduced into the grasslands of southern Saskatchewan. But other species were affected as well. One of our smaller owls here in Saskatchewan actually uses the abandoned prairie dog holes for nesting sites. So the little burrowing owl is another species at risk. Get rid of the prairie dogs, you get rid of the nesting sites. Also, with our harsh Saskatchewan winters, lots of our reptiles like prairie rattlesnakes, the greater shorthorned lizard, need places to get below the frost line to hibernate. If you get rid of the prairie dog holes, you're putting another species at risk. 
Thank you for joining me on our Species at Risk tour today. We've gotten to see a lot of the different animals here at the Saskatoon Forestry Farm and Park and Zoo. Some of them species at risk, some of them not. But always remember that you are also a species on this planet. And as an animal, all of our actions not only affect other species, but those act same actions can affect us as well. Like all animals, we need a healthy environment to survive. We need clean food, water, air, just like all of the other species that share this planet with us. And if they're having trouble surviving, what affects them will eventually affect us. Just remember that all life is interconnected. Like a lot of Indigenous cultures say, prepare for the seven generations coming up, not just for us in the here and now. Life on this planet is all interconnected. Individual actions matter. Let's do this together and let's make it positive.